All right, welcome everyone um, to the MN BioE class of 2024. Seems uh, crazy to say that, but it is. So, I know, it's kind of scary. <laughs> so today on the call is myself, Joy. I'm the graduate advisor and Dorian, who is our faculty chair director, person. Something, director. whatever. <laughs> I think it's lead officially. Lead owner of Bodhi. Yes, yes. The one with the big dog. Oh, so we just wanted to welcome you today. Welcome everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us. So we'll go ahead and get started. So this is our team. So Dorian and myself, like I said, and we also, our chair um, is Phil Messersmith. Um, and then Jana um, is the department manager. But you'll not only have us um, as your, I guess, bioengineering team, but you're also going to be, you know, you're part of the Fung Institute. So the Fung team is also here to help. So you are dual citizens of the bioengineering department and the Fung Institute. And the amount of support that you get during this program is immense. So all of these people that you've seen on the last few screens are here to help. <laughs> the funk group is really good. It's true. A lot of them have been around since the Fung Institute started and the MNG started. So it's a great team over there. Which means since you're dual citizens, you have two homes on campus. You are have Mud Hall, which is that photo on the left hand side of your screen. It's in quite, they just re-renovated re this building. So um, it is all about Fung and the Amenj. And then the, build, the photo you see on your right-hand side is Stanley Hall where I'm currently seating. Sit. <laughs> um, so over the course of the year, um, you will have access and being communicated with through a variety um, of modalities. But I guess number one starting off is the Fung Institute and their email address. Um, so if you just reach out to the Fung Institute at berkeley.edu, they will get back to you right away. Um, if you have questions about what's going on for new admin weeks that's been going on, right? All these different events that have been happening. Um, Make sure you check out the website if you haven't been there already, which I'm sure you have since that's how you probably got here today. Um, if you had questions and wanted to reach out to a current, current student or alumni um, about their experience in the program, make sure you click on the ambassadors um, link, which is on the new admin website as well. Um, and the password is just mh2024, but you should have received that via email. You are an international student. Um, you also have, will be communicated through the Berkeley International Office and you can reach out to them. And then also last but not least, <laughs> the bioengineering department. So if you reach out to bioe.mng at Berkeley, you will get a response from me. <laughs> that is the email um, box that I answer. So today we're going to talk about um, a few things. We're going to go over a little bit about financials, how to support yourself and how to pay for the MNG program. Um, we're going to go over the curriculum. We're going to get to know each other a little bit better because I think that's part of the, um, I guess, the sweet sauce, the, the really nice thing is getting to know your cohort, right? And so even though you're under you know, the Berkeley MH umbrella within the BioE department, it feels more like a home. Um, so it's get, great to get to know each other. And then we'll do Q&A as well with Dorian and myself. And pretty much you can ask us anything you want. <laughs> ask mm -hmm. us anything, whether it has to do with MH, whether it has to do with living on campus, being in the Bay Area. Bodie. Or if you wanna talk about <laughs> Dorian's dog. Um, another thing we can talk about. So um, 
we'll go ahead and get started on the financial portion of today. Um, so in terms of financial support, all financial awards are, um, are distributed by the Fung Institute. Um, so with your offer letters, you may or may have not received um, a scholarship, whether that be an opportunity grant or the merit-based scholarship, the Fung Excellence Award, but all of those awards have been allocated. Um, so there is a wait list that you can sign up for if any remaining funding becomes available and you can check out the information on the new admit website. So there's a, um, a Google form you can fill out just letting them know of your need. If you have any questions directly related to your funding package, uh, you can reach out to the Fung Institute at Berkeley. And we just kind of wanted to let you know um, that, about different ways to finance your degree, whether that's through loans. Um, some students do work while studying, but that can be very challenging um, as your classes are all over the place. You have your capstone project. So scheduling flexibility is key with that one. And it's the onus of finding um, any work either on campus or off is on the student. Um, so that's kind of where that's at. So most students don't work, to be honest, uh, since it is a full-time intensive program, but the ones that do, you just gotta remain flexible. So we do have a small guide about financing your MNG degree and goes into just a little bit more details of where, you know, different resources like the financial aid office website. If you wanted access to that, um, please go ahead and reach out to me and I can send that to you. So the fees are divided uh, per semester and the current um, photo you see here on the screen is this year's fees. Um, new fees are posted every year and are finalized in July, but it should be around this amount. We don't expect it to be wildly different um, than what is currently shown here. But again, that will be updated in July and be updated on the registrar's website. There also is a fee payment program where you can pay in five installments per semester if need be. So that's also available to you. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and do a deep dive, well, semi-deep dive into the curriculum, but mostly we're gonna be talking about your technical um, degree requirements, those 12 units that are part of the degree. Okay. All right, so I suppose I take over. Uh, by the way, everyone calls me Dorian, and um, you also have access to, to reach me if you want to. You'll have my cell phone number, and uh, you can always contact me that way or make appointments with me or meet with me, whatever you like. Um, so basically, the curriculum is, 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 as you've probably seen when you first signed up or looked at it, we have the tech leadership breadth issues and the technical depth classes. Um, the technical classes are, are, are bi-we graduate level classes. They're the 200 level classes. And, um, and they take up most of your time. We also, of course, have the capstone experience, which is uh, a split between um, five, five units over the um, semester. And so pretty much you can take any 200 level bioengineering class you, that you want, and it will count. Uh, the only requirements for any of these things are that you need to have them so they count, they, they're graded, um, is, is the main critical issue for, for any of these classes. You can't take them pass, no pass, or, or uh, SU, okay? Okay, so we have these uh, uh, technical concentrations that we put together, but these are really sort of like, just sort of like guides in case you're interested in certain things. You can really take any classes you like. Um, you know, you don't have to fix. I, I actually think that in some ways what you do is you're taking classes from different faculty to see how you solve different problems or how they solve problems. And then, um, and so the, the, the actual technical nature is something that's useful for you, but also it's sort of how do you approach the problems that matter most. And so sometimes you get, you can see different faculty teach different things. And um, and general, most most of the students tend to be general. So our typical schedule 
uh, this would be biomaterials and biomedical generally, um, is the one that we, we put up here. Uh, you can see that we have two classes. One is our uh, bioengineering 221, which is taught by Aaron. And it's very good. It's uh, uh, more about MEMS and microfluid de design issues. And that's, uh, uh, that's one class that's possible. There's also a basics of drug delivery class, which is another example. But you can sort of see how your schedule sort of fits together. So you have the initial units with the fung. Um, then you have your technical electives. And then, of course, your capstone project. Um, in the second semester, um, you know, you can pick other things. We have in this one, there's more materials. So those are biomaterials classes 215 and 216. Um, and they're and they're both, you know, those are both four units. The other classes that we like a lot are um, we have a, a, a needs-based finding class that that uh, one of our adjuncts, Sayed Husseini, Hussein, who's from uh, actually was originally from Abbott, now he's from a different company, um, teaches where that's I also help teach that class. It's kind of fun. We bring in uh, incredible people who give talks about global problems. And then we've talked about how would you actually find uh, what are the needs in this problem? And then working as a team, you come up with, with possible solutions for these needs based, you know, that's needs based um, determining, you know, what you need to do. Part of that's done because we want to try and avoid the engineering problem, which is, which I've fallen into, which is like, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you want to look at, you know, those sort of things. So those are, those are, uh, that's another good class. It's actually two units. You want to make sure you check out your unit level and also um, what classes. And it's always good to look at the whole year as you're planning. Um, we have fewer graduate classes in the spring than we do in the fall. So sometimes that's a little bit harder. So you could actually uh, probably take, you could probably take two classes uh, as shown here, these sort of like four unit or three unit classes in addition to a two unit, unit class that, that would be science class, for example. Okay. okay, let's look at the next slide. You can take classes um, outside of the um, of bioengineering as a technical elective. You can take one graduate class outside. Um, we kind of like it to relate um, to your MEng program. Um, it has to be graded and, and it cannot be, you know, like satisfactory, unsatisfactory. And generally you need approval from me or Joy. And, um, and generally, we ask you to fill out a, a Google form about the class you want to take. It is important to think about you want to check the, gla the class schedule to make sure, A, that it's being taught. Graduate classes are a bit funny. They change often year to year, or they're not offered. They are offered. It, it varies a bit. So you got to make sure the class is being offered. Um, check that you can enroll, because some of the classes sound really good, but they're actually from another master's program or something. And so as not being in that master's program, you may not be welcome. Um, and in general, most of the classes that are taught through the College of Engineering or Chemical Engineering are fine. Um, that's sort of a, um, not automatic, but it's pretty close, you know, pretty close to automatic. Other classes um, are interesting. Uh, so our students want to take classes in the business school, which is fine. There, it's really important to check units and grading because they also change. Um, you know, they have a bunch of classes that are short um, or, or are not great, you know, aren't, aren't, don't have a letter grade. Our public health department is great and has some also some really good classes. Uh, some of the some of the popular ones are things like public health 240. Um, it says a C in front, which means it's cross-listed and it's computational statistics with applications in bio and biomedical in biology and medicine. And then the other one, public health 245, is an intro to multivariable calculus, is another uh, useful class. Um, it turns out our public health department is, is, like, is like really one of the top programs in the country. Of course, it is also really uh, the cross listing I find interesting is statistics for that 240. Um, and that class, actually, if you looked at the statistics version of that, they would actually say that you, as a prerequisite, you'd have, uh, you need to take stats uh, 200A, um, which is intro to, problem at, uh, to probability and statistics at an advanced level. Um, so you'd have to check, you want to make sure you, you have the prerequisite set up so you understand the thing. And I also put this up because I find it amusing that you have an introductory class at an advanced level. You know, it's sort of like, like this oxymoron class title, which I thought was interesting. But, but these are things you can talk to with me and we can go over it if you, if you want to take some of these classes. There are also classes in biology, molecular and cell biology, plant, molecular, plant and molecular biology, and integrated biology classes. There again, you have to check availability and grading. Um, you know, so one of the classes that our students have taken in the past, uh, MCB 288, is right now listed as only pass, you know, S slash U. 
Um, so that wouldn't count for a technical elective because it's not graded. So you have to make sure you check that because, you know, as, as I said, graduate classes kind of change how they behave uh, or how they function. Um, but we're one of the good things is our director um, of the program, the overall director of the program is also, you know, thinks it's okay to take classes outside the, uh, of the department and you can take classes. And you can also take additional class, an additional class if you like, um, if there's something that you find really interesting. In general, I'd recommend if you took an additional class that you take it pass, no pass or something because it just lowers the bar on the workload. Um, and that's a good way to sort of take advantage of being at Berkeley. I'm always amazed because I've been here at Berkeley and I always wanted to take classes and I tried and I don't have the, I can't take a class. I can only audit a class, which means I end up not doing the homework and then I don't really follow the class because I don't have any um, you know, it's not graded or anything for me. So that's a problem for me. So here you could at least take it pass, go pass. And then, and that lowers the bar. Okay. Um, all these other classes do need help. And it is possible that you could get a second class if you really need it um, outside the department. That requires a little bit more um, permission steps because that, that's not quite approved by our program, but we can, we can have that happen if you need it. Okay. Next slide is... So um, course offerings, you want to check um, all the enrollments uh, open in July. Um, it'll tell you how many how many classes, how many cl seats there are in the class, how many seats are held for some programmer or whatever, and um, and then you register that way. Joy, do you have any comments about the? Um, I was just going to go over a few of the courses that were approved outside of the department this year. Okay. Um, that may be of interest to students. A lot of them have to do with data science and machine learning. So as I was digging in to see um, which classes those were, like Data C200, it's Principles and Techniques of Data Science, um, Mechanical Engineering 249, which is Machine Learning Tools for Modeling Energy um, Transportation, um, Chemical Engineering 274 was approved, which is Biomolecular Engineering, and mechanical engineering 270, which is advanced augmentation of human dexterity. So you can kind of see the types of classes that we approve outside the bioe department. So although you know you need to have the majority of your classes be a bioe 200 level course, these other classes that we've been talking about are also related to bioengineering. They're just not offered. Um, by the bioengineering department faculty, which is why they are housed in other um, departments, but doesn't mean it's not related to what you're learning. So that's what we really look for is how it relates back to the MEng program. So if you find a class that seems really interested, just be prepared to um, plead your case to Dorian and I of why this class um, can be taken for um, technical electives. That's why I mentioned the, the public health and the um, biology and all statistics, because those tend to, if you're interested in machine learning, tend to be rela relatable to, to your program. Okay. Do Any I questions about that? Yeah, someone has well, a question in the chat um, to expand oh. on what were the business school classes that have been previously those are difficult. I was looking at those. Yeah. And um, they're hard because they, they change all the time. But mm -hmm. there were some entrepreneurship classes related to biomedical devices um, often or uh, those sort of things. So often th they do have programs or they do have classes on uh, business like things associated with starting companies in the biomedical space or, or associated with bioengineering. And those are the ones that we tend to like. Um, you can certainly take more than four technical electives. Um, you just gotta make sure your workload's balanced okay. But I've had students who've taken more than four. And um, and again, in, in the worst case, what you do is if, if the class is starting to be overwhelming, you can always try and take it pass, no pass, because that really does lower it. Right, and as a graduate student, you're not bound by the same ad drop rules you were as undergrad. So there's a lot more flexibility um, in terms of that you find yourself in a bind <laughs> halfway through this semester. So I put together a list of the business classes. Yeah, the business classes were hard for me to put a list together for because they really do vary 
mm. a lot. Um, but again, if it's if it's reasonable, we'll approve it. Okay. Were there any other questions about the curriculum so far? Feel free to also just raise your hand um, function in, and then we can unmute. You can unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay. Um, well, if that's the case, we'll go ahead and move on. <laughs> um, so this is the part where we really just want you to have time to get to know other people that are also considering um, coming to the Berkeley MNG program next year. So we'll go ahead and we'll split you out into rooms, breakout rooms, and some ideas of what to chat about. <laughs> um, you can talk about your undergrad institution, why you applied to MNG, and ask each other questions of what are you still considering when making your choice um, for your next step? Um, where to live in the Bay Area? We can talk about, did you have previous work experience before possibly starting this program or are you straight from undergrad? And what your career trajectories are? How does this program fit into that? So there's some ideas. Or, or you can even come up with questions that you wanna ask. <laughs> yes. Right? Exactly. Always easier in a group. Mm hmm. So I'll go ahead. Looks like there's okay. Now twenty eight of us on here, and so I'll go ahead and split us up into seven different rooms, um, randomly. So here we go, and we'll go ahead. And I'll, and... Draw, I'll drop into a few just to see if anyone okay. has questions. Yeah, and we'll meet back here in about ten minutes. 10 to 15 minutes and go over any outstanding questions that you might have. All right, so welcome back. Um, hopefully you had a chance to get to know some of your cohort a little bit better. Um, and we just wanted to open it up to, I guess, an open forum um, with Dorian and myself and Bodhi about any questions that you might have about the MNG program in general, life at Berkeley, our backgrounds, anything of that sort. So you can either use the chat uh, function, or if you just simply use the gesture, raise my hand, then you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly. I can start a little bit from some of the questions I answered before. In terms of finding, figuring out which classes you want to take, um, it's always, what you can do as grad students is always just like register for some classes, you know, register for an extra class or something or two that you don't know whether you're going to take and then try them out and drop them. Um, that works. And then the other thing is, is you can always make an appointment with me or something if you're really confused and you want to talk about classes. I'm happy to talk to people about classes. And um, and then the question is like, as you will get your CalNet ID stuff, when do they get that, Joy? So after you have SIR, that process can start. Because I know a lot of you need that um, in order to start the visa process with the international office. So after you have SIR, that process gets started. Because then you'll also get a BCal, a Berkeley calendar account, which is a Google Calendar essentially. Um, and then you can see my calendar and then also and make appointments on my just by inviting me to a meeting, um, then I can uh, work with you on on what classes you might want to take or options or things like that. Okay. Haley, did you want to go ahead and ask your question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering what percentage of people go into like industry after or like PhD or MD, if you know like any like general percentages. In general, most of the students go into industry. We have a few students who will always who use this as a gap year between um, between their undergraduate and med school, and fewer go into grad school. But we often have a few students who are you know med school. Okay. Right. Yeah. Majority goes straight to industry at some venue. Yeah. 
And we encourage them to start companies that are going to make a zillion dollars in the future so they can donate back to Berkeley. Yeah, you'll see on the new admit website some of those success stories that um, are out there. <laughs> We're still waiting for those donations, Dorian. That's okay. <laughs> We're trying to learn how to do that at Berkeley. Um, what other questions did I get? Yeah, but it's sometimes hard looking at how many classes and stuff that are available and all your options. Um, again, you just want to try things. What is the startup process like? Um, you mean like as a company? <gasps> or just for the image? Oh, the startup process these days, a lot of it goes through. At Berkeley, we have all of these startup um, um, things where you can actually pitch your company and get some money to help start up your company, you know, to start whatever, go to the next step. Um, so a lot of our students end up uh, pitching their ideas to like the big idea um, program here. Um, there's also the, um, we have a, a, you know, a couple of incubator systems. We have the new Backer uh, Center for bio, uh, bio, Biomedical and bio, Biological Engineering type projects, largely. Um, and all those places have access to funding for essentially at that step where you've done enough work to pitch an idea and to have an idea that you think could go farther. And the idea there is we could take the money and the situ or the situation and um, just try to get to the next step that would help you, you know, start pitching it for real money. Yeah, so at Berkeley, there is something called Begin. So begin.berkeley, I'll put it in the chat. And that's where you can see all the different resources about, um, you view the directory, the different incubators and accelerators on campus. There's a lot going on in terms of startup land, startup world. Um, so there's that. Um, someone asked about the estimated tuition for the MEng program. And you can see back at a previous slide, I won't go jump back to it. It depends on if you're a resident or non-resident. Um, I believe it's about 50, Six if you're a California resident and 64 if you're a non-resident. Um, but the official numbers are on the registrar's website. That's per semester. Um, we are expecting class size, um, we're expecting somewhere between like 50 and 60 students this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's standard our standard size. We're a little bit up in the we, we're never quite sure because we've had two, as I explained in one group we're post COVID and that made all everything all, all kind of strange. EB, have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, sorry. My question was related to the getting approval for courses that are outside of the bio -eng, like mm -hmm. uh, technical set. Um, is there like a date where that has to be submitted to you or get approval by? Is that like in terms of like planning? Um, you want to do it early enough so that we, you know, it's usually um, before the semester starts because you want to be able to register for the class and get in it. So you have to first, you know, and so there's to get approval so you, so you know what your schedule is going to be. I try and handle those as fast as I can. Yes, and that, and sorry, just to clarify, that that starts July, right? Is that is that what you said? The sort of this open. You can actually up. talk to me before July. But okay. uh, yes, it all, it, you know, because we can see what classes are being offered and which ones you could pop up, probably get into. Because I can always just give you, you know, I can say whether it's okay or not, and then you can try and, you know, the hard part always is sometimes getting into the class, uh, depending if it's in a different department or if it's associated with another um, professional master's program. Sometimes those are harder to get into. Okay, great. Uh, classes Thank from you. electrical engineering, computer science are extremely hard to get into. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, you can already see the fall schedule is already out on the website, on the registrar's website. Um, and then as well, um, you'll start registering for classes in mid-July. So nothing too concerning or, um, or urgent at the moment. 
So someone asked if it's possible to change concentrations. Um, honestly, at the end of the day, a concentration is not put anywhere. It's not on your degree. Um, it's just something that you may or may not list on your resume. And since you can take classes, you're not restricted in any matter of any way of what classes you take um, in terms of those 200 level classes. So there's really no need to switch, so to say. <laughs> um, okay, the job market um, is in bioengineering, in biomedical type stuff seems to be holding okay. A lot of the big hits were in, um, in the IT world mainly. But um, that's always hard to say. I've found that our students generally get jobs afterwards. Um, even thinking about our undergraduates over the years, the, the, the main thing is being able to, one of the critical issues is being willing to live somewhere else. Um, if you want to focus only on the Bay Area, sometimes that's hard to, you know, that, that could make it harder. But in general, our, because this is a professional degree and you also get more training and you have all this um, other contacts through the MEng program, I have not seen any problem with students getting jobs, including international students. Um, the companies generally um, have no problem. You know, it's not like they're going to say, "Oh, we're not going to hire someone because they're foreign." Um, if they're the good, it's the right person for the company. No, no company does that. Um, do they recognize it might cost more? Yes, but that's just what you do. When we were, when I was in industry, that wasn't going to be a huge issue. So someone asked about the OPT application. So that's something that you'll get into next February. Um, so you're very early jump, jumping that, but the process is you, you apply about three months before you um, are graduate from the program, because that's how long the um, processing time takes with USCIS and processing your OPT application. And then you are eligible for the STEM extension. So you have your 12 months, um, OPT plus 17 months STEM extension on that. All right, someone asked about housing. So there is a bunch of different housing resources that you can um, start to find on the new, new admit website. But just to go over a few things, a lot of students, particularly like to, and even domestic students, love living in iHouse, um, which is on campus here because you get to meet people from all over the world. There's a meal plan you have. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of students that live there and there's other graduate you know, housing co-ops all around campus that you can apply to. Yeah. I've had graduate students who've gone to the, who've been in the co-ops. Um, they seem mm. to like it. Yeah. Um, the iHouse is interesting because also once you, once you live there, you become a member of the iHouse community and then you can actually stay at iHouses all around the world. So it's kind of cool. Let's see, someone asked a bit about the capstone project um, process. Um, okay, that's really, um, I mean, really basically you come up with an ordered list of capstones that you like. And I think faculty look at the students and talk to them, you know, and, and come up with their list and they try and do some matching of groups. Um, it's kind of like applying for a job. So you apply for your top three capstone projects. These you know, capstone advisors look and see who they want and then they make offers. Um, and then you will be matched most likely in the first round or so um, with the project. There's just a lot of, I guess, pieces to that puzzle to make everything work. But I would suggest that you go back on the new Abbott website and they did a whole hour session just about capstone projects. So you wanna go back and watch that You more than, able to. I would, I would pick a capstone base basically on whether the project's interesting to you or not. Mm -hmm. that, that's really, you know, because you, it's always much more fun to work on something you're interested in than something you're not. Let's see, someone, let's see. Uh, no, switching to EECS is really hard. No, you were admitted as a BioE and your application reviewed was reviewed as a BioE admit, so you weren't um, they're not able to switch departments once. Or double major. Yeah. 
And also EECS is very, very uh, they're, they're sort of overwhelmed in general. And so they don't tend, it's very hard to, for um, students outside of EECS right now to take EECS classes, much more in terms of the CS side of things than the EE side. Um, if there are EE classes you're interested in, um, I might be able to get you in since I work a lot with the EECS through the EE part of it. It's very challenging though, so. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't plan on it. Yeah, I would not plan on taking EECS classes while you're here. It's a more realistic view. Um, so someone asks if they could extend to the summer semester or is there a thesis? So the program is two semesters, so fall and spring. There is no option to extend into summer. Um, and it's not thesis based, it's capstone experience based. Um, so although you will you know, have to write a paper as part of that capstone project experience, there is no traditional MS thesis. All right, so I had some questions about, let's see. There's a transportation one. There is some yeah, sort so of, there is a transportation pass. Yeah, so there is a pass that um, you will get each semester as being a Berkeley graduate student that is for AC Tran all of AC Transit. Hey, let's um, right back. And use that to get all around on the bus system here. Um, and you'll also be able to, like there's a bus, there's buses that go um, to San Francisco as well that are AC Transit buses. So in terms of um, everything career related, there's a ton of resources. You are heavily <laughs> um, resourced and heavily, um, I guess, guided through the Fung Institute. There's a whole career development team um, that puts on a ton of different networking events, fireside chats, there are different career fairs, alumni network, um, engagement events. Um, so check out the new admin website. There's a whole nother um, webinar, I guess you would say, about everything career related. I think it might have might have already happened, so you can go back and watch that. So let's see, what date does the program end next year? I guess so in 2024, it'll end, um, usually ends, I don't know the exact date <laughs> off the top of my head, but it'll be like the second week of May. Second week of May is usually commencement. So first week of May, you're finishing up doing your final um, capstone presentations. And then you're graduating like a week ish later <laughs> in commencement at that. It's time. on our calendars yet. Yeah. <laughs> Someone asked if students partake in multiple affinity groups or just stick to one. Completely up to you and what you want to get into. As you look at all the different affinity groups that the Fung Institute houses, you might be interested in multiple ones. So it really just depends on depends on you. You. I guess the amount of resources and different things happening on campus is way more than the time that you have available to that. So you'll have to pick and choose what's of most interest to you, whether that's through the Fung Institute, there's all these different um, challenges on campus. There's all these different um, things at the Haas School of Business that you can participate in. So there's a plethora. I don't remember the exact numbers, by the way, about how competitive it was this year, but usually it's about the top third of applicants. They're in the top 30%. Let's see. Okay, so I have to step off here for another meeting. It is 2.30, so we'll have to go. Uh, We'll end this so everyone can get back to what they were doing. And, um, but if anyone has any additional questions that they weren't able to get answered, uh, make sure that you 
you can email myself, you can email the Fung Institute, and we will answer all of those questions for you. We look forward to seeing you all in the fall. Yeah, that'd be great to see you all. And I will get back to you, Carson. I'm, I'm working on it. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.